I would just like to welcome everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody from around the globe. That's kind of amazing. Um, to our Brown Bag Lunch, the Gender Equity Initiative of the ABAA is really thrilled about these uh, talks that we give um, usually once a month. And uh, we are so excited to have Ali here. Ali is going to be the, the title of her of their talk is Pop Bibliography, Finding Book History in Popular Media. I'm gonna start out um, by saying happy Valentine's Day to everybody. And then I'm <laughs> and I'm going to um, uh, give a little background of, for Allie and then I'm gonna let Allie take it away. So here we go. Um, Allie Alvis is the curator of special collections at the Winterfer Winterthur Library. They are also the facilitator of Rare Book School Mellon Fellowship for Diversity, Inclusion and Cultural Heritage, as well as the editor of the Sharp News Features section. Ali has formerly worked as the rare book cataloger at, uh, for Type Punch Matrix and as a special collections reference librarian of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. Their research is diverse and far reaching and includes publications on the reuse of type ornaments in 16th and 17th century England, the work of bookbinders Douglas Cockrell and Son, and the use of are cynical green pigments in bookbinding. Ali is particularly interested in the use of social media for communicating book history and maintains a pop popular accounts across various platforms as Book Historia. You must follow them. Must follow them. <laughs> They're fantastic. They received their MSCs in Material Culture and Book History and Information Management from the University of Universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow respectively, and a BA in linguistics from the University of Kansas. They will be teaching a course on pop bibliography for Cal RBS in August. So don't forget that if you wanna sign up for that in August for Cal um, Rare Book School. Take it away, Allie. All righty, let's share the old screen. And I'm gonna do the Zoom thing of, can everybody see this? <laughs> we good? Okay. Awesome. So without further ado, the 20th and 21st centuries can be characterized by the ubiquity of creative media. From the earliest blockbuster silent films to juggernaut modern franchises, from board games to AAA video games, from weekly comic books to webtoons, modern life is permeated by highly visual fiction, which people consume both actively and passively. Being a fan of a certain TV show or game is a powerful group marker, with these fandoms expanding from the early days of mailing material back and forth to today's online spaces, which facilitate group discourse at breakneck speeds. While these fandoms frequently exhibit growth that resembles organic grassroots organizing, they are not purely fields of wildflowers. This is agriculture with companies planting the seeds for these fan communities in order to generate a profit. But this type of propagation is not done only through creating lovable characters and plot twists that leave viewers on the edge of their seats. It is also done by crafting settings that resonate with particular groups. Jessica Pressman analyzes this phenomenon as applied to books in her 2020 work, Bookishness which examines the establishment of a, quote, identity derived from a physical nearness to books. She discusses how Big B books as a marketing and popular media concept offer intimacy as a refuge from digital capitalism and cultivate a fetishistic nostalgia for a time when books smelled. But why these books? For a general population that has more often than not never physically interacted with a book printed or created before the 20th century, why do they look at a book on screen or in a video game and say, ah, the presence of this old book tells me that this is a medieval setting, or the person using this old book must be a wizard, or this old book with strange designs must be a valuable tool for the scholar character. Frequently, these old books present as what people in the field of rare books and manuscripts recognize as strange chimeras of physical attributes from different periods, cultures, and uses. 
However, certain repetitions of anachronistic form emerge when looking at, say, magical tomes across various media properties. The creators of these chimera books are clearly consciously and subconsciously referencing each other's work and aesthetic vocabulary. But where did this vocabulary originate and what can it tell us about the popular understanding of the book as an object? These are the questions that the concept of pop bibliography aims to address. Pop bibliography draws from both the ideas of pop art and Megan L. Cook's dirtbag medievalism. In 1957, Richard Hamilton described pop art as popular, designed for a mass audience, transient, a short-term solution, expendable, easily forgotten, low cost, mass produced, young, aimed at the youth, witty, sexy, gimmicky, glamorous, and big business. Similarly, Cook boils down her dirtbag medievalism which addresses the earnest, bombastic, kind of meta-medievalism distilled through the internet and pop culture one might see in a medieval times restaurant or in a Dungeons and Dragons campaign, to 10 key features. It is commercial and wants to be noticed. It is a creature of mass media and will find you. It is accessible. It gestures towards historic, historical accuracy, but is not too worried about it. It is more often more about the present telling on itself than the past. It does not aspire to cultural authority. It is ideologically porous. It is effectively earnest, but is not primarily educational and can be a matter of intention or reception, but is more often the latter. Both of these concepts address the marketing utility of various media, as well as the idea that profit and appeal tend to be prioritized over concerns of accuracy. Umberto Eco's statement that we are still living under the banner of medieval technology is true of both the real world and the worlds of fiction, even if that banner acquires a few modifications in a fictional setting. The medieval rise of the codex, the early medieval rise of the codex format, thanks to the expansion of Christianity, has had a far reaching effect on the way Western culture conceptualizes both knowledge and the sacred which is sometimes quite literally inter interpreted in media. Books being used as visual shorthand for knowledge is not a new concept. Strolling through any portrait gallery will yield a host of historical examples of upper-class people explicitly using books and libraries as props to communicate the image of an intellectual. Books are more than repositories of text. They are icons of knowledge, notes Jessica Pressman. And Brian Cummings, in his discussion of the book as a symbol, observes that more than any other object, old books are felt to embody not only a physical memory, but also a record of past thoughts, of transforming what appears to be purely immaterial and conceptual into something with a concrete form. But considering the general populace's unfamiliarity with old books, Media properties that feature such objects are using them as symbols of symbols. They are deep in skewmorph territory, with their physical attributes serving no purpose other than to evoke pastness. Cornelius Holtorf describes the primary attribute of pastness as exhibiting a particular appearance corresponding to the past in your imagination. Exploring the concepts of created environments, such as Disney theme parks, he notes that the level of attention Disney designers give to material clues and other details ensures that guests in the theme park do not admire the verisimilitude of what is ultimately complete artifice, but that they are made to put the very distinction between real and fake behind them. He quotes one of the designers of Main Street USA in Disneyland Paris. We're not trying to design what really existed in 1900. We're trying to design what people think they remember about what existed. This concept of pastness is the most important attribute of pop bibliography. Books and manuscripts and fiction don't need to be accurate to get their point across. They just need to look like how you think you remember them looking. And when the only way most viewers have meaningful, meaningfully interacted with medieval or early modern books is through fiction, creators are no longer making up objects that reference objects from the real world. They're referencing a reference to a reference. The recursion is the point. 
An object is most credible when it corresponds to people's preconceptions and looks as though they imagine it might, thus confirming what they already know. A desire to play up pastness is behind the vaguely publisher's cloth binding in this Scooby-Doo screenshot, just as it's behind slapping the word Dracula on a limp vellum binding. You can see the concept shift between these two generations in how far away the past they're trying to evoke is. With all of that said, let's look at the key tenets of pop bibliography. It is commercial. Just like dirtbag medievalism, pop bibliography's primary function is marketability. Books and media look cool and interesting because someone wants them to look cool and interesting in order to appeal to a variety of audiences. And the tastes of audiences are prone to change. This can be seen by tracking the visual development of books as featured in long-lived franchises such as Magic the Gathering. Players now expect a certain level of complexity in Magic's card illustrations, and by extension, the books that pop up in them. The art directors are happy to oblige. The card on the left is from 1993, and the card on the right is from 2023. Pop bibliography plays very well with Pressman's bookishness to cultivate not just an identity as a reader, but a reader that values the past. Pop bibliography is usually not the center of attention. It can be seen in the background of films in which books are never addressed or discussed. It can be seen as the constant tool of the video game mage, or as the key MacGuffin that will resolve a fantastic plot. It can even be observed in books humanized to various degrees who act as supporting characters. But pop bibliography is almost never the main character. I am purposely adding this almost never caveat here. I welcome any media examples where an old book is the protagonist outside Swift's Battle of the Books, and even here the books are so humanized that they kind of lose their codicological attributes. This is by design. Bookishness in the Pressman sense is particularly effective when the audience has an avatar through which they can envision themselves in a fantastic environment and that they can identify with in the real world. The number of researchers and heritage professionals who have posted this gif of a harried Gandalf rifling through old books and papers with the caption, me today in the reading room, is very far from zero. It is diffused, a dream of a dream. Echo describes a variety of ways of dreaming of the medieval period, outlining 10 little Middle Ages. His definition of dream in this formative piece aligns more closely with an interest, or a striving for, or a hope. The dream inherent to pop bibliography instead denotes an unconscious state, where the wanderings of one's mind fade in and out of comprehension, concrete shapes and ideas flowing around and through each other with no concern for boundaries, conceptual, physical, or temporal. Pop bibliography is the image of what you think you remember about books. It is a blend. This diffusion and blurring of borders generates a sort of book stew for designers to dip into. This stew is full of chopped up, decontextualized physical attributes in different amounts. For example, a spoonful will frequently contain a leather binding, conspicuous wear and tear, and calligraphic contents, but sometimes you wind up with an illumination from an Arabic tradition, or a 19th century pictorial cloth binding. The ending credits of the 2023 Dungeons and Dragons film is a spectacular example of this blending. The main ingredient is a gradient of Western late medieval illumination into Persian illumination. It hops from manuscript to print in the visible bite of the figure combined with a bestiary inspired illumination. And then, to the late 19th century in the form of this style of movable book. And a second example, though the 1994 movie The Page Master is very bookish in the Pressman sense, it does not dabble much in pop bibliography. However, its title sequence, composed of aesthetic nods to manuscripts and early printing, is. Pop bibliography is fetishistic. It exploits the remoteness of the general public from quote-unquote real old books to create desire. 
But this idea did not spring from the void. It is rooted in an older cultural concept. The historical unattainability of books contributes to persistent ideas of their mystique. The sense that certain kinds of books are perpetually out of reach is a remnant of the pre-mid-19th century period, when the vast majority of books were far outside the price range of the common person. The role that highly embellished books have traditionally played in religious contexts also lends them a sense of sacred untouchability. This mentality is perpetuated in the 21st century by misconceptions about the accessibility of special collections libraries and the high prices of many books on the market. At the same time, books as a commodity are so ubiquitous today that their form and function are generally taken for granted. But the medieval manuscripts, early modern herbals, and massive religious works sporting bars and chains that inspire the depiction of books in fictional properties are no less real than the books on the average shelf. This recent hand-wringing tweet from Marsh's library in Ireland is an anecdote of how the fetish aspect of pop bibliography manifests in the general public though the despairing tone shows a marked mishandling of an opportunity to engage on the visitor's level. I will address this more fully later. Pop bibliography strays into the real world. Circling back to its commercial nature, pop bibliography is a prime candidate for merchandising. These embellished blank books for sale in a shop in Disney World are replicas of the pseudo-medieval storybooks, that feature in the opening sequence of Disney's Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella. I personally own this plastic book safe that is a replica of a key item from the Cardcaptor Sakura anime. However, paper blanks journals, which are notebook reproductions of extant rare books and manuscripts, are not pop bibliography, which leads me to pop bibliography's final attribute. It is not real, but it doesn't mind if it's taken as such. Facsimiles are not pop bibliography. In order to fit the pop bibliography mold, someone has to have gotten kind of weird with it. Properties such as the ascendance of a bookworm anime in which the development of the codex form and movable type printing in a fantasy setting are a key plot point, dance this line. While most people wouldn't look at a wizardly tome in Dr. Strange's library and say, this is a historical object that actually exists in the real world. They very easily could get that sense from Jennifer Lopez receiving a quote-unquote first edition of the Iliad from the male love interest in the 2015 film The Boy Next Door. Even though this is an actual 1884 Chicago edition of the Iliad, as translated by Alexander Pope, it has become an object of pop bibliography through context. Real is a difficult word to pin down sometimes. Establishing the idea of pop bibliography is not an effort to scold non-specialists for depicting books incorrectly. This is not a prescriptive concept. Rather, it is descriptive. Acknowledging the presence of pop bibliography content allows us to get a sense of how people outside the field conceptualize the past and of how they understand book history in general. We can get a sense of how pop bibliography manifests through using the trading card game Magic the Gathering as a case study. Magic has a sometimes subtle, sometimes explicit relationship with books and their physical forms, from the design of card backs to resemble book covers to the in-game terminology for a deck called a player's library. Codices with physical aspects associated with old books serve as visual shorthand to create a particular environment and atmosphere when they appear in card art, and also contribute to the construction of a sort of manufactured cultural nostalgia that is meant to immerse a player. Magic boasts over 40 million players, over 22,000 unique illustrated cards, and an ever-expanding collection of lore that adds dimension to the gameplay. With limited space on each card for storytelling, efficiency of communication is everything. Card art does the narrative heavy lifting, adding context and flavor to game mechanics and creating a space for players to see themselves. The many worlds of magic are situated in the broad category of fantasy, which owes huge aesthetic debts to the Western medieval period and ambiguous concepts of academia. 
the artists and designers use a number of visual cues to establish this, this setting and feel, including the presence or absence of books. The basic concept of the gameplay of magic is that the players are planeswalkers, magical beings that can move between different planes of reality, and they are engaging in a wizardly duel by casting spells and summoning creatures, as represented by cards. The cards also contain units of the magical energy needed to power their wizardry in the form of five colors of mana, represented by a card type called land. All magic cards display the same layout, card name at the top, followed by an image, then the card's type, and finally the card's text, which describes how the card is used and its effects. Sometimes there will also be italicized flavor text, providing storyline context or anecdotes that are not strictly necessary for gameplay. To win, a player must get their opponent's life total to zero by attacking them with creatures and spells. Within Magic, the setting, lore, and plot are generally called flavor by the game's designers, hence flavor text. Having a good metaphor eases gameplay, head designer Mark Rosewater said in a 2003 article. If players can apply outside knowledge to implicitly understand game rules, the game's complexity goes down. The flavor text is the only in-game explanation for how the events, objects, and figures depicted in the card art interact with each other in the overarching narrative of each new set of magic cards, which are released quarterly. Rosewater freely admits that the trading card game format is not the easiest place to tell a story, and this mindset has allowed Wizards of the Coast to focus more on cultivating a game environment with the cards rather than a full narrative. Books are one tool used to create this game environment in both a meta and literal sense. As I mentioned, in magic terminology, a player's deck of cards is called a library. The idea is that all the creatures a player can summon and spells they can cast are contained in a magical tome, as Rosewater calls it. Another method of winning the game is by making your opponent draw all of their cards thus depleting their library and making them unable to take any more magical knowledge from it. This concept is reflected in the design for the backs of the cards, which loosely resembles an 18th century modeled calf binding with a central panel. The book form was further reinforced in the packaging of early starter decks and sets, whose boxes featured page edges and even a bookmark. The bibliographic motif has also been reflected in in-store display materials, such as this original booster pack display box from the 1997 Weatherlight set. Many books that appear in magic card art feature physical attributes that read as medieval or otherwise of the past. Chained books are a common sight, with the chains not only in chains used not only in the traditional sense of being a type of anti-theft device, but also in quite whimsical ways to keep buoyant books from floating away, or to be used to create a menacing atmosphere. Metal furniture is another binding attribute that is common throughout the planes of magic, taking various familiar and unfamiliar forms. A particularly flexible motif is the central roundel on the front board. While it is sometimes a metal boss, the roundel most often takes the form of a gemstone, similar to the ones on this treasure binding from the Walters Museum, and later in the bindings of Sangorsky and Sutcliffe. The contents of books are less often showcased in card art, but also reveal strong Western medieval and early modern manuscript inspiration. Their pages are usually yellow-hued, either to imply aged paper or that they're parchment. There is almost always a focus on the book's illustrations and general layout, rather than an effort to convey textual information in the card art. This is for logistical reasons. The small size of the art as it's printed on the cards makes it very difficult for text to be reproduced clearly. And Magic's massive international distribution means that text incorporated into art would be challenging to adapt for localization. From Magic's inception, game designers and artists use the fetish status of old books to enhance the setting and draw players in. Richard Garfield, who created the game, 
noted that he specifically wanted a player's deck to be called a library to impose a layer of ambiance on the very act of drawing cards from it. In order to get a sense of where this ambiance originates from, I have interviewed several artists about from where they drew their inspiration for the fantastic books they included in their art. Some, such as Randy Gallegos, who is the artist of Tome of the Guild Pact, described that they looked closely at individual physical books to get a sense of certain aspects of their forms, in this case, the damage to the spine. But many, including Howard Lyon, who illustrated Enlightened Tutor, and Dan Scott, who illustrated Cogwork Librarian, have said that they, quote, didn't think about the books too much, or noted, quote, old leather-bound books as a broad category of inspiration. Still others, such as Kieran Yanner, artist of Vessel of Malignity, expressed that he, Ouroboros-like, was inspired by extant fantasy books, such as the Necronomicon from Evil Dead or books as illustrated in Dungeons and Dragons manuals. Conversations with these and other artists who work for Wizards of the Coast on magic cards reveal key details about their references to actual extant old books. A pattern that emerged is that artists couldn't pinpoint their inspiration for certain physical attributes of the old books that they painted. They arose from a nebulous general concept of how old books should look, which was primarily drawn from other media representations rather than first-hand encounters with the books themselves. Generally, the artists tend to use Google Images as a starting point, which is not surprising. Different library catalogs and digital repositories can be difficult to navigate even for rare book professionals. Common search keywords for the artists include ancient tome, which turned up a fascinating array of material when I searched it several years ago. The uh, search will turn up a different sort of material these days, which I will get to later. This is the kind of self-perpetuation inherent to pop bibliography. Heather Hudson, who illustrated the card Geth's Grimoire in 2003, recalls that she created that particular piece in a time before the internet in her professional life. Instead, she used an old Webster's Dictionary as the primary physical reference for this girthy volume, which features nods to the practice of anthropodermic bibliopegy, finding a book in human skin. Randy Gallegos, who, whose art for Tome of the Guild Pact appeared in the 2019 Ravnica Allegiance set, noted that specifically for the wear to the book's spine, he used a book that he has at home, a Spanish language history of Ecuador that is an old family owned book of his wife's. Folio of Fancies from the 2009 Throne of Eldraine set is a primary example of pop bibliography in action. In my interview with the artist Colin Boyer, he noted that one of the only strict requirements the art directors had for him was the inclusion of this keyhole motif. You can see this keyhole repeated on the robes of the wizard Gadwick on another card from the Throne of Eldraine set, Gadwick the Wizened. Folio of Fancies and Gadwick the Wizened are kind of partner cards aesthetically and functionally. In Gadwick's art, we see that Gadwick is pondering our folio front and center, while its winged friends flit about in the background. This keyhole motif shared by these cards is a clue that Gadwick and Folio of Fancies play what play well together mechanically. Boyer cited two broadly defined pieces as aesthetic sources for the page decorations of folio, an unspecified illuminated manuscript and a work by, quote, Leonardo on the fall off of light on cast shadows. The illuminated serpent that appears on the left page is clearly inspired by a medieval bestiary likely the 12th century Aberdeen bestiary, given its prevalence in digitized circles. Meanwhile, the da Vinci illustration comes directly from his Paris manuscript C, which was executed in the late 1480s. Boyer's art presents two works that are nearly 400 years apart in history and quite distant geographically as part of one book, presumably as executed by Gadwick or some other individual in fiction. 
Many magic cards depict the vibe of what medieval books should look like as a delightful mishmash of medieval and early modern characteristics, passed through the lens of extant fantasy aesthetic vocabulary. It gives us a fascinating glimpse of how the artists and designers of magic conceptualize and leverage the idea of old books. The historicization helps to construct a mythos for the players to inhabit and has thus translated to commercial success. Mark Rosewater notes that Strixhaven, which specifically foregrounds bookishness through its setting at a magical university, was, until the Lord of the Rings set came out last year, the best-selling premiere set of all time. The people at the helm of magic cultivate a sense of nostalgia and identity, specifically through the inclusion of books in their settings, to evoke a sense of a fictional past while reinforcing the idea that books are a thing of the past by putting them in a wider neo-medieval context and rarely featuring them when the franchise dabbles in science fiction. Properties such as magic are where dirtbag medievalism and pop bibliography beautifully intersect, each concept amplifying the other. Professionally, I have used an understanding of pop bibliography to aid in my efforts in outreach and education. Acknowledging the baseline old book experience of the general public is an invaluable tool to meet them where they are. For example, their recognition of fictional chimera book at attributes in real world objects is a great jumping off point for more in-depth discussion. Even misunderstandings arising from pop bibliography are important. When someone assumes that all old books are handwritten because the word manuscript is applied willy-nilly in pop culture, or that you should be wearing gloves when handling rare material because of what they've seen in movies, they are telling you about themselves. The tweet I mentioned before, the pearl clutching over a visitor who wanted to know if the old books on the shelves were real, would have been an ideal opportunity to engage with that visitor using pop bibliography as a foundation. Pop bibliography gives specialists an educational jump off point. Pop bibliography also offers an occasion for introspection as a book historical profession. In our love affair with digitization, have we really done enough to let everyone know that these resources exist? Have we talked about them in a way that implies or explicitly states that these digital objects are not just for academic researchers, but for artists and makers to use as inspiration? And what books exactly are we making available this way? While I, a veteran of navigating digital collections, could pull up a digitized book bound in pigskin with metal bosses in about two minutes flat, I'm not sure where to start if I wanted to view digitized examples of Japanese, Chinese, and Korean book structures or Arabic illuminated manuscripts. This Western focus is especially telling for an artist, designer, or author who is uncomfortable looking for information beyond Google. In a somewhat recent twist, so-called AI image generators have added their spin to the concept of pop bibliography. Glorified art plagiarism machines, these image generators macerate swathes of data and produce visuals that are usually at the far edge of the uncanny valley and are frequently downright creepy. In March of this year, Suzette Van Haren asked the mid-journey image generator to produce medieval manuscript page, 15th century, book of hours, Dutch photo from above, and this popped out. On November 14th of last year, I enlisted colleagues to prompt Dolly 3 and Mid Journey to produce an old book, a magical tome, and an illuminated manuscript. Is this pop bibliography? It is certainly commercial, diffused, a blend, fetishistic, straying into the real world, and is sure not real. It's flattening centuries of bibliography into one visually interesting form, but it's also not human. The reason pop bibliography is a useful lens is that it gives us a glimpse of the human mind, highlighting the sticky aspects of the physical forms of books that resonate through the centuries. Observing this pop culture game of old book telephone wouldn't be a useful exercise if every call along the chain were randomly generated. It might give us a sense of commonly occurring forms and traits, which is interesting, 
but is not the same point of inquiry. Aside from the material culture and philosophical questions of what it means to generate an image of a digitized manuscript that doesn't exist, I agree with Dot Porter's sentiment. Manuscripts and old books are interesting because of the humanity behind and in them, and AI muddles or destroys that context. This is a topic I will be working through more fully at a later date using pop bibliography as a framework, so watch this space. Recognizing the influence pop bibliography has on how people understand rare books and manuscripts allows practitioners in book historical fields to connect and reflect. It tells on us as much as it does the general zeitgeist. There is inherently a large element of autoethnography when confronting it. Looking back on your own experiences with Chimera books on screens or pages before you'd ever set foot in a reading room. I hope that taking the significance of pop bibliography into account will present new opportunities for inquiry in the material culture of the book. Thank you. Thanks, Allie. That was amazing. <laughs> um, I actually have a quick question because I thought it would be helpful for everybody here. Um, when you talked about makers and artists, um, you and I, of course, know how to, you know, go to libraries and, and access. So what would you suggest to people who are really interested but feeling um, timid about going in and asking if they can see things? Uh, that is a very common feeling, not just for, you know, people off the street, but for rare book professionals. Um, when researching pop bibliography, I actually went to the Library of Congress, uh, their reading room for the first time since the pandemic. Um, and I had been used to sort of working with Library of Congress materials, at, like reviewing their physical nature, conducting a census of this particular binders work, that sort of thing. Um, but I had never gone in to like think philosophically about the old books and the imposter syndrome I felt sitting in that reading room, <laughs> looking at these like incredible examples of book history and thinking about them was incredible. And that's not to say anything about, you know, the people at the Library of Congress are nothing but helpful. But, you know, there's just this sense that Am, am I worthy of, of looking at this stuff? And yes, yes, you are. We wouldn't have this stuff unless we wanted people to look at it. Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah we might as well be a book safety deposit box otherwise. Um, this, this stuff is for you to use, whether you're writing a monograph on it or uh, thinking of tattoo designs or something cool like that. Like, we love remediation and people working with the stuff in new and creative ways. It's yeah, do it. Right. So just come, go in and, or call or email, mm -hmm. make yourself known that you are interested in looking. Yeah. And hit them up on social media too. Okay. There are, you know, a lot of libraries maintain social media presences on Instagram and Twitter and fewer on TikTok, but getting there. Um, you know, send them a DM, uh, comment, just sort of reach out. Um, you may not get an answer because social media people are <laughs> kind of uh, stretched thin sometimes. Right. You, you, you have four jobs or five jobs, but there are yeah. a lot of um, universities and libraries on on um, Instagram. I And yeah. great, great people to follow and it's really wonderful. Um, so we have a couple of people who have their raised hands. Um, We've got to get uh, Jin in here to um, open them up. I think Jesse has been yeah. on. There I'm you go. Unmuted. Yes, yes. Well, first, I loved your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. I have to confess, I am an early adopter of of, of AI for literary and humanistic purposes, so I look forward to our future debates on that topic. <laughs> but um, uh, I have a really, uh, I have one of those longest questions that sometimes I, I, I dread, um, so you have to bear with me. <laughs> um, so in in in, ep in episode seventy, part two of the Skibbity Toilet series. Oh uh, my God, Jesse, I love you so much already. Let's go. <laughs> in, ep in episode seventy, part two, uh, there's a really important scene where the se secrets of the origins of the Skibbities are contained in what looks like a full calf leather bound volume with deckled edges. Right, uh, really important scene. So I have two points on this scene that will lead to my question. 
First, there is a lot of visual elements in Blue Gray Skibbity that are actually repurposed digital assets from the game's Half-Life and Counter-Strike. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's not uncommon in the Machinima genre, as, as you know. Um, and second, the, the most of the tracing of these assets doesn't occur in the metadata of the short itself, right? So, you know, it's not in the, in the YouTube metadata. It's, it's in the comment sections and it's in these analyses videos, right? So it seems to me that it's a form of textual criticism that's being applied here, right? Uh, which leads me to the question, could a, a descriptive form of popular biography be applied to a more expansive definition of the book itself? Uh, one which I think you've done well with your Magic the Gathering example, um, and one that encompasses bookish non-book text. And if so, do you think that the comment section, fan wikis, fan-made remixes, and commentary are the proper places to point to these vernacular metadata as a form of documenting the migration of the digital assets that are reused? That is an excellent question, and I cannot wait to watch this episode of Skibbity Toilet. I've been fascinated by that whole phenomenon, so now I have an excuse. Um, but I think that, yes, fan uh, environments and comments and these sort of more casual modes of discussion um, are where a lot of this stuff is coming from. Um, you look at any wikia of any fictional property, and if there's a book prop or something, there will be a wiki page on it, um, sometimes healthier than others, um, depending on, on who worked on the wiki page. But um, I think these Spanish discussions are, are very important. And um, I mean, part of the, the trajectory of my scholarship has always been to make these discussions more accessible to everyone, not just uh, scholars and academics and people in college classrooms and whatever. So I think that um, having these online sort of textual descriptive resources tied into these Spanish spaces is a great way to do that. Um, I've had some success with Magic the Gathering of just sort of blasting this information out there as it relates to the game um, that, you know, some big players have found it interesting and whatever. I'm not sure if I'll ever see any result from that. Um, but the point is that it's getting out there. People are consuming it in some way and whether they're going to act on it in any meaningful way in the near future, you know, whatever. Um, but if that's sort of planting a seed for them to consider later or to mention to someone else who is interested in this side of uh, media, I think that that's really important. Um, Rebecca Romney has this concept that I always quote of uh, karmic book selling, where, you know, if you're engaging with somebody uh, as a bookseller, like you may not sell them the book that day, but it's still a worthwhile conversation to have because someday they might come back and they might buy that book or they might buy something else from you or they'll know that you are a good enough person to talk to somebody that won't necessarily buy a book. So I think this sort of karmic nature of goodwill discussion of book history in this way is, is very important. Yeah, fabulous. Um, we've got uh, Pam's got her her hand up for a question. Can we unmute Pam? Here we go. Take it away, Pam. Um, not unmuted. So while we're waiting for that, I'm going to have a question from Alexandra. Uh, uh, Alexandra, okay. Are real historical books that are then fit into a fictional tale part of this category? Thinking of Ashmole in the discovery of witches, novels, and TV series. I think so. And I think that there is a lot of blurry areas between like, this is a historical object and this is pop bibliography. Um, because like that first edition of the Iliad example, it's like, well, yes, this is a real book. This does exist. It was published in the 19th century. It is a historic object. It's not what they're saying it is. <laughs> so I, I think it's that um, sense of what the media is saying that this book is, is what's important. Um, so if, uh, if we're talking about Ashmole and things like that, 
Um, it really comes down to like what the role in fiction is. If it's being treated as like uh, the Ashmolean collection was established and blah, 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 and was composed of this and that, um, just sort of a factual statement, then like, sure, that's that's facts, that's history, um, sort of in a fictional setting, but used as world building. But if it's something like, you know, Ashmole had this secret stash of, of manuscripts written by uh, mystics from like early modern Italy or something like that, um, and they, they contained real magic and uh, were bound in the flesh of dragons and you know it doesn't have to be that crazy it can be as much as he had a secret book that had a secret code or something like that right. that I think does become pop bibliography and there's a lot to be said for historic pop bibliography too um, when you're looking at 19th century illustrations of uh, biblical scenes or medieval scenes or things like that they're not really depicting what book historian professionals understand as the codices of the medieval period or um, the uh, BC period or, um, you know, that really early period. They're kind of just making books how they think that books should look. Um, so I that's, that's a, a thing that I want to pursue uh, more fully. Got it. Okay. Um... Jin, can we um, unmute Pam? It looks like she did not actually have a question. She said, "Okay, there you go." Okay, so now I next have the next question is: um, I wonder whether from John Henry Adams. I wonder whether there's a similar vibe to steampunk or sci-fi machinery that doesn't really serve a purpose, but it's supposed to recreate a particular feeling. Pop engineering? Question mark. Oh my God, I love that. I love pop engineering. And yes, it's exactly that. Like, you know, the top hats with all the gears and the goggles and like, what are you doing with those gears? What is the purpose that they serve? Like their decoration, but it's it's like signaling that it is of this um, sort of alternate Victorian time period where machinery is very important, but it's like, why? What cultural reason in fiction explains that? It's It's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think that this concept can be applied to uh, many different things like engineering, um, like, I mean, even interior design or ornament or things like that, uh, where you look at a Game of Thrones or uh, Kingdom of Heaven or something like that. And um, like, why is everything so dark and dirty and grungy? Like, historically, <laughs> that's not really how the middle middle ages were like what's going on with that what cultural reason is behind that where did that um, start it, right yeah yeah and the medievalists really have that on lock right but i've got it's um, that same sort of thing i think susan benny are things like uh digit digitization of collections but also the distribution through platforms like instagram on feeds like vault slash editions and and contributing factor in the wider exposure to the concept of antiquity. I sense? hope so. Okay. Uh, I mean, things like, uh, you know, a library can scan all the books at once and put them online. And if they don't say anything about it, uh, whether through press releases or on social media or through events at the institution or, you know, any other form of public communications, um, then what's the point of having them there? Because they're pouring all of this money, all of this labor into these uh, digital objects. Um, and you really want to get your money's worth. Um, so one way of um, dealing with that is through sharing things on social media and Instagram and sort of less common um, academic spaces. The danger though, and it happens a lot, uh, is people will lift these images and put them on Pinterest or somewhere else, or they become a meme or whatever, and the context is completely gone. Um, that is one of the reasons why I always watermark my uh, social media videos now. Can you um, explain because... why that's dangerous or what the danger, quote unquote, danger is behind behind that? So, um, you know, if you save an image offline uh, and you think like, oh, I really like this flower, um, the caption has, you know, this is this kind of Dahlia and 
um, you think like, okay, yeah, I'll save this picture to my phone. Um, so that way in the spring, I'll remember to plant this specific breed of dahlia. Uh, six months later, you go back into your phone and you see that flower. Well, what, what kind of flower was it again? I don't remember where I got this. And I remember I wanted to do something with it. But that happens a lot with books uh, and illustrations and things like that online, where someone either uh, sort of innocently or uh, someone who wants to claim credit for this image will lift something out of its descriptive context saying, you know, this illustration is from this specific book held by this specific library or from this specific bookseller and puts it up with no information that effectively completely cuts off a line of inquiry for the majority of people looking at that picture. Um, nerds like me will spend hours tracking down the source of an image, but not everybody has the uh, sort of taught skill to do that or the time, frankly. Um, so if you see like a cool binding on Pinterest, but you don't know where it's from, then, you know, is it 16th century? Is it 17th century? Is it English? Is it Italian? Is it American? Like, what, what is this? You, it just, it becomes this isolated object that doesn't speak to the time that it's from, but just kind of is around as its own thing. Yeah. I mean, we used to be able to write on the back of a photograph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so know where we got it from. But um, yeah, so there, I've got a couple more questions. Um, is there a platform that centralizes all digitized books from um, France Hoyard? I mean, there are things like the Internet Archive, which I will recommend forever. Um, but that is a, an elective sort of platform um, where institutions and people and companies partner with the Internet Archive to have their stuff put up on the Internet Archive. Um, Google Books has things like that where they've scanned uh, books. But again, it's really sort of piecemeal and it's unclear like always where they're getting the books from. Mm -hmm. And um, Hathi Trust is another good platform, right. um, which is can be inaccessible to people without an institutional affiliation, which is a pain in the butt. Um, there are also um, digital databases behind paywalls, which is very annoying um, that, you know, you can get like this entire corpus of 18th century books, but you have to pay us hundreds of dollars if you want to see right. them. Um, so unfortunately, as of now, there is not really a centralized place for digital books, but right. a lot right. of libraries have their own sort of boutique um, digital platforms that, you know, uh, they host their stuff on Winterter Library uses Content DM, although I think we're going to be migrating to a different platform soon. Um, so if you go to a library's uh, website of special collections um, and sort of look for their digital collections, um, I recommend doing this with the uh, Hunterian collection. They have amazing stuff. Um, you can usually find a link on those websites. Uh, but another good way of doing this is just following the libraries on social media because they like to post the pretty things and the they do. visually they do. interesting, and, and interesting, things. very interesting things. Um, another one. Yeah. Do you have any um, concrete examples from um, from Rebecca Doherty? Do you have any concrete examples of how, as a rare book librarian, you showcase items from your collection to creatives? We have a lot of amazing materials that I am not always sure how to how and, what, and whom to market. And you do a great job of that. So this is a great question. Yeah. So um, personally, I, you know, I do social media, like that's my thing. Um, and I try to put out high quality, highly sourced um, information um, that is accurate. And I'm lucky enough to have built a fairly large audience over the years. So I have that sort of inherent uh, platform from which to disseminate this stuff. Um, but now, uh, as a curator at an institution, um, we also have programs like the uh, Maker Creator Fellowship at Winterthur, which is specifically for makers and creators to come and do arty stuff with the collections, uh, whether that's look at our ornament books and create upholstery designs or 
uh, write a play about the history of Winterthur, or um, one of my favorites is someone who's looked at um, documents of old parquet floor designs uh, and planted radishes in the those designs in order to break up um, old pavement at Winterthur that we no longer want. So it's wow. this like really artistic way of engaging with not only the collection, but with the space. And it's really cool. Um, but I think the important part of that is to not be so academic about it. Um, you know, it's great to publish papers and write articles and give lectures and stuff like that at universities and um, do it in that sort of setting in that audience. But it's just as important to do things like nerd night, uh, <laughs> which is this sort of uh, global um, organization that hosts like academic talks in bars. That's their whole thing. So it's like this really, it's high level topics for audiences that are not necessarily from that discipline or from that specialty. And it really forces you to um, not only think more about what the general public is going to find interesting, but it's a really great way to connect with the general public and say like, hey, we have this stuff that I'm talking about. Like, right, I mean, like taking trivia night a little bit further Right. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, because people are so interested in that. It just would be a great way for universities to kind of, you know, get people to gravitate um, towards that. I have another uh, Petra Clark. Thank you for an amazing talk. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on a bookification of text ideas in popular media that did not originally appear in codex form. I'm thinking in particular of the the Black Book of the Dead from the Mummy 1999. Mm, interesting. I know, yeah, because like if you're thinking ancient Egypt, you're not in Codex land. Like this is this is scroll territory. Um, but I think that yeah, I have seen this great reproduction at a convention of the Black Book of the Dead and with the bars and everything, and they were they used magnets. It was a really cool reproduction. Um, but I definitely think that that is in the realm of pop bibliography, uh, especially in the sort of Westernization of it. Um, there's this uh, sort of move, even in, um, I mean, I'm most familiar with anime as examples of this, anime and manga, uh, where uh, this this came up the first time I gave this talk, but um, someone asked me a question about isekai manga. Um, isekai is a genre where uh, the main character is transported into this fictional world, usually that of a video game or a book or something and they wake up and they find that they're the main character or that they're the villain or whatever but a lot of times when they're flashing back to look at these books um these people from japanese settings like this is clearly a japanese person in japan reading this book um they're shown like super duper western early modern like they have furniture they have um, just all of the hallmarks of a Western old book. Uh, and, you know, it's it's really fascinating because, like, if you go to a Japanese bookshop and buy a book off the shelf, like, it's not going to look like that either. So, like, there's this, this sense that, um, and I think this comes with the, the globalization of media, this flattening of the, the Western codex form as this prestige form. Um, one of the magic cards I showed, uh, it looks like a, um, let's see, like a, an Asian Batak manuscript um, where the boards are uh, sort of unfinished wood. Uh, the interior is made of bark and it's sort of in an accordion format. Um, the magic card does a very bad job of depicting this, um, but you can tell that it was that was the inspiration but they kind of turned it into this weird codex and whatever um but they were using that book specifically to evoke otherness like this is some sort of exotic weird book from a, a people that are unlike those who are you know doing the main part of this plot um so i i think this non-western othering is is a very interesting topic and bringing it back to the um, uh, the mummy, I think having that book be a codex, sort of in the context of, uh, you know, the um, I can't remember her name, 
but the the main character being a librarian like this kind of fits in narratively with like um the scene of her tipping over the bookshelves and working with other codex type books that it, it kind of comes full circle narratively um so that may have also been one of the reasons behind why they they went with the codex right um actually this actually goes into it um this question from sarah nora uh, do you think there's a difference between attitudes in the U.S. and Europe around the ideas of accessibility to collections? I think so. I mean, like, um, having lived in both places, um, just the accessibility of quote-unquote old books in Scotland is something that is kind of crazy to the average American. Like, you can go to a charity shop and get a book from the 18th century for a couple of pounds and that's like not weird <laughs> and in america like you just don't really see that kind of thing in part because there aren't that many books from that period here because a lot of them were produced in europe um you know the the western culture was very much based in europe for a very long time um and in the colonial period uh when that sort of mode of living was exported forcibly to america um, it took a while for printing presses and binderies and stuff to start up. Um, and even when they did, you know, the quality of the material was usually subpar. The paper was kind of yucky. Um, so not only do you get these sort of really rare publications because um, they couldn't really produce a lot of them, but they're really rare because they were falling apart very quickly. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you see like uh, a lot of late 19th century school books and things like that. Um, but I, I do think that that difference is very interesting. Um, and I would love to think more about, um, I, I guess, kind of like that Scooby-Doo slash Dracula <laughs> screenshot I showed, where it's like the gang looking at this um, uh, publisher's cloth binding versus the cast of Dracula looking at this massive uh, vellum binding where like it's different concepts of what the past is like the American past in the popular consciousness only goes back so far whereas the European past goes back much further right um, so they kind of have more to work with there right I mean we, you know in the trade we call, talk that you know the the ugly brown books but a lot of times yeah. <laughs> brown books are sometimes some of the most important ones. You just have to mm -hmm. take a closer look. You have to take it out. You have to open it up because it's not going to be on the spine. Mm -hmm. um, that brings me back to one of the points I was thinking of when you were talking. Um, I was so disappointed during COVID in a lot of people's libraries. You know, a lot of people had the whole thing behind them. Yeah, yeah. People that were, you know, very scholarly that were being interviewed on TV and their books were just, you know, pathetic <laughs> and I was, mm -hmm. I was just like waiting for somebody to have this great library behind them so um yeah oh one more person asked um you know something about like gatekeeping how do we reconcile uh, here, the books and making them access gatekeeping yeah i know it that is always kind of the um the at the heart of rare book librarianship is right. you know, we do want to preserve these things for future generations, but we also want everybody who wants to look at them to be able to look at them. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's why rare book libraries have um, different handling standards in place. Uh, why we set everything up on foam supports or on book pillows or whatever and use snakes um, and have... Um, somebody sitting at a reference desk kind of watching everybody work. Um, it's not because we don't really trust the people in the reading room. It's because we want to be able to be there to help if they need it. Um, because we've we've done this a gazillion times. Um, and it sounds kind of twee to say, but so much of rare book handling is vibes based. Like you pick up a book and you kind of feel what it wants to do. If it wants to flop open then you need to get some supports under there if it wants to not really open very far then you kind of have to meet it where it is uh for lack of a better phrase like you just have to go by feel um and it takes a while to sort of um adjust your instincts there um but i think returning to the the gatekeeping issue 
um, especially with the um, the France Huyard said, uh, you know, registering at the desk and proving you're 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 serious about your uh, inquiry. And I think some libraries are better at this than others. Uh, the hoops that I had to jump through at uh, library undisclosed to view some stuff for my second master's degree to like look at one book that was not really that big of a deal, but they had flagged as special for some unknown reason because it came in with a bunch of other stuff and it, it's a whole thing. Um, but like I had to get a letter of recommendation to see this book. Like that's bizarre. You should just be able to register as a reader and see the stuff. Um, but, you know, the registration is is part of the, the um, maintaining the collection for future use, um, because if something happens to happen, uh, if if we don't know who was the last person to look at the book, then we can't really retrace our steps. Um, but I like I said, a lot of libraries are getting better at this. There are still uh, improvements to be made. Um, especially in terms of, um, you know, catering to researchers who don't look like the uh, scholar who has traditionally been an occupant of this reading room. Um, people of color are traditionally very put off by these spaces because it, there's this sense that they're not welcome there because they're not part of this somehow. Um, right. And that yeah, is something... Why... That's why I always suggest, you know, and I'm sure you do too, is the best, kind of the best starting point is going to some of these rare, um, rare book shows, um, book mm -hmm. fair. Yes, because because book fairs. Yes, because book fairs, like you can look at anything. Of course, we them. want, you know, we want in the trade to be selling these books. We also want to be opening this up to everybody so that they can see the books. It doesn't necessarily have to, as you said earlier, um, end in a sale. It's It's about, you know, handling books and so when you know people come into my booth I'm always said yes please you know and mm -hmm. I just show them how to do it as you said you know you don't really want to open the book completely and that's the first way you you know to get people to start that process of feeling comfortable and and seeing that everything everything is successful mm -hmm. uh, and Sarah yeah. Warner just said part of registration is the understaffing of many places yeah, right, but, exactly. uh, a lot of libraries are kind of strapped for cash and we are trying to preserve the collection while making it as open as we can with half as many people as we really should have and everybody's doing um, five jobs at the same time so that's yeah well, we are definitely running over time this was fantastic <laughs> um Allie always always a pleasure thank you thank you um, and feel free, everybody, to hit me up on social media. Um, I'm also on various email platforms. Um, I'm aalvis at winterter.org. I'm alexandra.k.alvis at gmail.com. Um, and you can always reach out to anybody at the ABAA and say like, hey, what? how do I get in contact with Allie? And they'll tell you. <laughs> Thanks again, Allie. All right. Thank you. Have a good Valentine's Day. Yes. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. <laughs>